Good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, energy seminar. It's kind of a nice follow on to last week's seminar. For those of you who were here, it was about um, a federal uh, climate technology policy plus. Uh, this week we're going to hear about the state version of that from the biggest state uh, in the union and the, is it now sixth biggest country in the world? Fifth? Fifth biggest economy in the world. Um, but uh, I am unworthy to introduce such a person, so I've asked my friend and colleague, Mike Mastrandrea, who is the uh, director of uh, research at the Woods Institute um, Energy Climate and Energy Program, as well as uh, the policy director of the Door School of Sustainability uh, Accelerator Program. But perhaps most importantly for this job is the chief uh, advisor to the Energy Commission on energy and climate, uh, specializing in R&D and technology assessment. So you may see a little bit of a link in here. Mike, by the way, is not only a graduate of the Stanford uh, EIPER, Emmet Interdisciplinary Program on Environment and Research, here at Stanford Interdisciplinary Program, which has existed for 22 years, three years. He is actually the first graduate of said program, a building on an undergraduate degree in biological sciences also here at Stanford. Uh, and when he introduced Joni, you'll see he also has an interesting and deep uh, connection and background with uh, Stanford. So Mike, take it away. Great, thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the very kind introduction. It's, it's my pleasure to introduce my close colleague, Jonah Steinbeck, who is the director of the um, Energy Research and uh, Development Division at the California Energy Commission. And um, before joining CEC, he was, uh, first he was uh, a student here. He did a PhD in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, um, also an MPA from the Harvard Kennedy School. And, and prior to working at CEC, he worked on climate and clean energy policies and initiatives at the Department of Energy, uh, at the federal level, also the American Meteorological Society, um, and at the White House Council on Environmental Quality and in the U.S. House of Representatives. So I'm going to hand it over to Jonah without further ado. But thank you very much for being here. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, great to be with everyone today. Thanks for uh, coming out during a busy uh, time in the term here. I'm sure you've got a lot of uh, demands on your time, so appreciate you coming today. Um, and thanks to the Energy Seminar organizers uh, for the opportunity to connect with you all and share a bit about um, the energy innovation activities that we are investing in uh, through the California Energy Commission. Um, and um, yeah, great to be back on campus. Um, a lot of fond memories of, of being in rooms just like this, um, sometimes for exams, uh, which is more stressful, but for most of the time, most of the, most of the memories are fond um, uh, when looking back. So um, I'm going to be um, just giving you an overview of um, some sample projects that we've invested in, so technology innovation research projects, um, and also previewing some upcoming uh, programs that we're excited to launch with new resources, and then also briefly touching on opportunities to connect and, and collaborate in the future. So um, a lot of this uh, work that we're conducting at the Energy Commission is motivated um, by global climate change and addressing um, the urgent need to meet our greenhouse gas goals as a state, um, uh, in particular uh, the goal for carbon neutrality by 2045. Um, this is a, a chart from the California Air Resources Board uh, showing uh, the emissions um, in 2022 and then looking out to 2045 and what we need to do across all these different sectors of the economy. Uh, namely, you know, dramatic reductions um, in every major sector. Um, you can see some residual emissions in 2045 that um, we anticipate needing to be addressed through carbon removal strategies. So either leveraging um, natural and working lands or engineered solutions, which I'll talk about um, a little later on. So the Energy Commission is the state's lead energy policy and planning. Uh, agency. Um, we uh, uh, work with the private sector, with uh, community groups, um, with research institutions to advance uh, energy systems that are clean and reliable, um, uh, affordable and equitable. Um, and this includes uh, targeted investments and uh, policy and planning in the areas of 
uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, clean transportation. Um, we do analysis uh, for the long run uh, to meet our mid-century goals, as well as help prepare and respond to uh, energy emergencies in the near term. Um, so I'll just go through different sectors that are uh, key to uh, the Energy Commission's work towards those uh, the carbon um, targets that I mentioned. Uh, so in electricity, our guiding policy uh, in California is 100% clean and zero carbon uh, resources by 2045. Uh, we're making uh, strong strides on this one. So over, um, well, in the neighborhood of, of 60% um, today. Uh, so 37% renewables uh, as of 2021. This, this chart's a, a touch out of date. Um, uh, large hydro and nuclear making up the remainder. And um, another key development and um, area of leadership for California has been the deployment of uh, battery storage. So um, uh, going from 2019 to, to 2023, um, uh, we're experiencing about a tenfold increase of, um, of battery energy storage on the grid that helps complement intermittent renewables and balance the grid. So that's a key um, component of uh, achieving this goal. And then um, you can see at the bottom right of the chart that um, we anticipate needing around According to this um, core scenario in our SB100 analysis, our analysis for achieving this uh, mid-century goal is we need around 50 gigawatts, uh, 50,000 megawatts of uh, energy storage. So we're around 13% of the way there in terms of filling up that little uh, battery graphic. Um, this is a look at um, the individual resources, so the mix of um, resources that we think could be uh, key for achieving this 100% uh, renewable future. Um, so this comes from the SB100 analysis that I was mentioning that the California Energy Commission led uh, together with uh, the Public Utilities Commission, um, Air Resources Board, and others. And um, uh, a couple key points here, uh, just a, a rapid increase in the size of the, um, of the grid in terms of its capacity um, is gonna be needed particularly as we electrify buildings and transportation, we need more electricity. Um, and utility scale solar and battery energy storage are gonna be uh, key um, parts of the portfolio, but other resources like offshore wind and long duration energy storage are gonna be important um, in 2045. And um, we're, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about some of the efforts we're undertaking to advance those technology areas. And then what's not shown here is also uh, that, um, other key strategies, including energy efficiency, demand response, um, also customer um, uh, solar as well, which isn't shown here. So in the transportation uh, space, we're, our state um, target here is 100% zero emission vehicle sales by 2035 in the light duty segment and by 2045 in the medium heavy duty segment. And we're making uh, good progress uh, here as well um, in recent years. So you can see in 2017, um, we were under 5% um, uh, share, uh, share in EVs as a share of the total um, sales. And then uh, in 2023, we're approaching, well, hit 27% in quarter three. We'll be a touch over that by the end of the, by the, end of the year. Um, there's a massive out, uh, build out of chargers needed to support um, this growth of EVs. So by 2030, we anticipate having around 7 million um, EVs in the state, needing about a million chargers. Um, so it's a, it's a tall order, but we're making uh, good progress uh, in the early stages of um, the build out. We're approaching 100,000 um, chargers. You know, assuming a, uh, a, a, an exponentially increasing uh, kind of trajectory as you see in, in sales, for example. Um, and we just reached 10,000 uh, fast chargers as well, which are important for um, particular duty, duty cycles and, and uh, uh, certain user needs. And then in buildings, um, we've conducted some analysis uh, looking at a 40% reduction of GHGs by 2030 and some of the different strategies that would be needed to achieve that um, and are implementing a range of different um, uh, policy initiatives, uh, one of which the, the CEC has authority over is the building energy code. Uh, so ratcheting that um, over time in a way that um, uh, leads to greater electrification, movement away from uh, gas end use, 
Um, and uh, we also are, um, have electric ready requirements in the building code and are in the process of doing an update for, for 2025 that'll be even more ambitious. And um, the building code in California is really kind of world leading model. Um, so not only is it important for um, California, but it's also helpful for thinking about kind of the frontier of energy performance um, in other jurisdictions. Um, the governor announced a, a six million uh, heat pump deployment goal by 2030, and we just um, uh, announced a commitment with um, major manufacturers of heat pumps. Um, so um, uh, close to a dozen um, manufacturers have committed to work with the state, partner with the state to track this deployment and um, work to obviously deploy and hit this goal, but also to do it in a grid friendly way. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about load flexibility. The next point is um, related to this as well. So we um, set a, a seven gigawatt load flexibility goal um, for 2030 at the CC together with our uh, partner agencies. Um, this goes beyond the building sector, but um, it's important as we electrify the building stock that it is um, able to uh, you know, um, be uh, grid friendly, you know, operate in a way that um, uh, uh, helps balance the grid. Um, we're really fortunate to have a wonderful new set of resources, uh, both um, th through the state as well as the federal government. Um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provides over $60 billion in energy infrastructure and energy technology funding. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act um, provides important tax credits for solar and storage and heat pumps. Um, and the state level over the past two budget cycles um, have, as a state, we've made a $50 billion uh, climate commitment, and this includes around $7 billion for the California Energy Commission. Some of the other pieces are going to other agencies for um, a wide range of mitigation and adaptation uh, uh, initiatives. And so at the CEC, um, we're really fortunate to have this great augmentation, a lot of it focused on EV infrastructure build out to move from 100,000 to a million um, chargers, for example. Um, clean energy, building decarb, and, and grid reliability are some of the other areas. Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna be focusing in this talk on, on the R&D portfolio, and um, of that uh, seven um, billion, there's over a billion dollars in R&D um, that's gonna support a, a suite of new uh, programs, which are shown here in the bolded text, uh, building on some of our foundational programs like the electric program investment charge which is our electricity R&D program. And um, most of the examples, project examples that I'm gonna be speaking about come from Epic, and we can take some of the um, progress and momentum from Epic and uh, use it um, to uh, you know, accelerate our progress in these larger scale programs that are more deployment oriented. Um, through, through Epic and just more broadly, um, we do, um, uh, take a targeted approach to, uh, to our investment, looking at where there are key barriers in the technology innovation pipeline. Um, so as some examples, uh, the CalSeed initiative under Epic is uh, intended to help um, innovators, kind of the early stages when they have a concept for a product or a service uh, or an early prototype and help move that forward. Uh, CalTestBed is um, a program to uh, give access to leading labs across the state and demonstrate the performance of the technology, get third party validation and help build investor confidence. Um, out on the other um, far end of the innovation spectrum as you're getting closer to uh, market maturity, we have the RAMP program, which is uh, intended to uh, support the automation of manufacturing of the technology. Um, and then we also have a, these regional innovation clusters um, throughout the state where there's um, business support services, ecosystem, uh, sorry, kind of um, uh, networking support and so forth to, um, to support uh, entrepreneurs across the state. Um, so I'm gonna be speaking about um, a, a number of EPIC project examples, as I mentioned, and so I just wanted to give you kind of a high level view of what the program is delivering. Uh, we've invested over a billion dollars uh, over the past decade through EPIC and that has catalyzed over $10 billion in private follow-on investment. So that's kind of a nice uh, demonstration of the catalytic effect of uh, public investment. Uh, this has led to commercialization of over 70 technologies. Um, and another piece that I would highlight is uh, we're investing 70% of the 
demonstration and deployment funding for um, in under-resourced communities. So we're trying to advance a more inclusive approach to uh, clean energy innovation. And so now I'm just going to give you a little tour of uh, some different uh, projects uh, in sort of no particular order and, and a little bit uh, random jumping across different sectors of the economy. Um, the first one is uh, an investment in just building our knowledge base um, so that we can do better planning um, as a state, better, have, make better decisions um, in, uh, as uh, electricity system planners or, or um, various parts of the energy infrastructure. Um, so this, this is an effort to get more granular information about the, the climate that we anticipate. Um, so taking global climate models and using uh, the latest um, uh, state-of-the-art techniques to downscale those, um, those models to get more granular, geographically um, uh, 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 specific information. Um, this is a, an example of precipitation changes by the end of the, the century. Um, and we've got a lot of different uh, variables to help us with understanding, um, for example, uh, the increase in air conditioning load associated with just a hotter climate, um, how hydro might respond as precipitation uh, changes um, occur, and wildfire risk um, as we have a, a drier and hotter climate. So um, this is going to be a powerful tool for us as a state, and um, we're making this data available uh, for broad use, um, so we've got the, the CalAdapt uh, platform um, that's providing um, a kind of broad access to this data. Um, and uh, you can uh, visualize the data and uh, there are limited there's limited data for downloading. And then we're developing this new kind of pro tool called the analytics engine, which is on the right. Um, so this uh, includes hourly data out through 2100 of like 200 different scenarios. Uh, inc incredible amount of, um, uh, of, of, um, of data to analyze and understand and, uh, and draw insights from. And so um, if you're doing research in this area, you can uh, tap into this um, wonderful new resource. Let's pause and take a quick sip of water here. Any, any questions um, before I move on? So, um, we have an indoor air quality um, portfolio as part of our overall investments. Um, so as an example, uh, back in uh, 2009, we funded a paper that um, I looked at formaldehyde from new construction uh, and specifically composite wood materials. And that's led to, um, uh, led to a, a important update on the, on the building code as well as a carb regulation for composite wood. Um, more recently, uh, uh, looking at emissions from uh, gas stoves. So um, <clears throat> NO2, for example, can build up above um, health um, thresholds uh, when there isn't ventilation used. Um, uh, and so that's a pollutant of concern. There can, there can be issues with particulate matter as well. Um, some of you may be aware there was a recent Stanford study looking at benzene emissions from gas stoves. So we're trying to better characterize the emissions, uh, the types of chemical constituents, and what the health implications might be for residents in these homes. Um, um, we've invested over a mil hundred million dollars in microgrids across the state, um, supporting the development of uh, more than three dozen microgrids to demonstrate the value of these uh, resources as um, uh, 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 sources of, of energy resilience in communities. Um, and improving the communications and controls uh, for operating these optimally. Um, so this is one example from the Blue Lake Rancheria, which is in the northern part of the state. Um, it was able to um, support uh, 20,000 residents after the earthquake last December, which you may recall. Um, and it was also credited with saving four lives um, by uh, keeping some medical equipment uh, powered. Um, so these are you know, really important um, for energy resilience and, um, and can be um, also supportive of the grid as well um, in other situations. Um, Gradient is a really innovative firm uh, developing uh, this heat pump um, heating and cooling technology um, and making it more accessible to more people. So um, uh, sort of like the, the window AC unit you may be familiar with. 
but this can do um, heating as well, and it can do it super efficiently, uh, reducing greenhouse gases and um, saving money for consumers. And it can be installed uh, by the resident. Um, so this allows someone to access this technology, um, you know, uh, um, take it with them if they're a renter, for example. Um, and so uh, we see a lot of opportunity for these types of solutions that are kind of lower cost and easier to, to access. And then uh, the next one here is uh, Smartville. So uh, Smartville is um, advancing uh, second use or repurposing of electric vehicle, bat uh, electric vehicle batteries. So um, once a, a battery is degraded to the point where it's less useful in a car, it still has a, a fair amount of capacity and can be reused again for stationary storage applications for um, providing some resilience again uh, locally or providing some grid support and um, helping us reach our uh, storage uh, capacity targets as a state. Um, and it kind of builds a more uh, circular economy approach with batteries. We're also looking at further down the line, recycling the materials in batteries and looking upstream. I'll talk a little bit about upstream, um, more sustainable approaches to the materials that are going into batteries. Um, 12 is a really innovative firm. Um, uh, Stanford PhD, um, Yatasha Cave uh, shown here and, and uh, other Stanford co-founders. Um, so they're taking uh, waste CO2 and making uh, chemical precursors for a wide range of products like jet fuels and plastics, um, car parts and apparel. And um, so this is a really promising technology to pair with carbon capture uh, technologies, for example, in the industrial sector um, and make good use and kind of provide additional value to waste CO2. Um, and they're growing rapidly as a firm. So this kind of example of a really successful um, startup. Um, another one in our por portfolio is a Watt EV. So this is going to be the first e-truck stop in California, um, which should come online in about a year. Um, so this is uh, near Bakersfield, California, and it's an area of the grid that has um, electricity distribution uh, constraints. And so um, to kind of maximize uh, what they could provide in terms of charging trucks here, they um, uh, uh, deployed this d distributed energy resource approach where they um, built a solar array. Oh, they're in the process of, I should say, um, still undergoing. Um, and also paired with a battery uh, storage system and then the controllers so that um, they're able to charge about 50 uh, electric trucks over um, completely off the grid um, on average and then uh, a grid ch tide chargers um, in another part kind of lower down um, so this allows uh, charging you know, overnight and so forth, but um, able to provide a greater charging capacity than otherwise by uh, utilizing distributed energy resources. Um, Antora is um, developing a really interesting uh, thermal energy storage uh, system. So using carbon blocks uh, to store the thermal energy, uh, for example, from uh, renewables. And then um, late, and it's contained in these insulated uh, containers. And then later days or potentially weeks later, um, accessing that thermal energy for industrial heat or um, they're actually developing these uh, cells that can convert the thermal energy back to electricity. So this is uh, pretty cool. Um, these thermo photovoltaic cells. cells. Um, so uh, sort of like PV, but rather than tuned to the spectrum of sunlight, they're tuned to the spectrum of uh, thermal radiation. Um, CalFlex Hub is an initiative of uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, so this is uh, looking at the controls and the communications for making um, building energy uh, appliances and equipment more grid friendly. Um, so uh, taking information about the price of electricity or greenhouse gas uh, signals or flex alerts from uh, the California independent system operator and using that to inform where to maybe um, shift load relative to where it may, may have occurred otherwise um, and help support the grid in that way. So this is an example with um, hot water heaters, but um, they're looking at 15 different applications, CB chargers, 
um, HVAC units, et cetera, um, and trying to better understand how to optimally transfer data, communicate signals, and have these uh, devices um, uh, support the grid. Um, and here is a somewhat similar example, trying to leverage uh, the flexibility in electricity demand um, here for irrigation pumping. Close to 4% of the state's electricity use is in um, agricultural pumping. And so it's a major uh, opportunity to, to shift around load to better match up with uh, renewables, for example, or avoid periods of high demand. Um, so Polaris was able to um, demonstrate 25 megawatts of um, shiftable load uh, across 20 different farms in California and also showed some uh, labor cost reductions by automating uh, the, the, the um, controls on, on the pumps rather than doing it in a manual fashion. Um, Ohm Connect is doing something similar in the building sector. So this is aggregating lots of different residential uh, consumers and um, uh, helping them uh, break, aggregate those uh, uh, reductions uh, to be able to participate in the electricity wholesale market. Um, so they track, they're tracking you know, grid conditions and seeing when wholesale markets are spiking um, and then can call on their uh, 200,000 users across the state um, I think they may be outside of California now too, but um, I think they've got over 200,000 users now. Um, and uh, they can reduce their load. Um, the Kaiso market uh, compensates Ohm Connect for that load reduction. And then Ohm Connect can then um, pass along that incentive to um, their users um, for making that reduction. So this is a really uh, cool um, way of aggregating small loads um, SkyCool systems. Um, a number of these are, are, are Stanford connected innovations, by the way, and I'll, I'll, I'll highlight that a little bit more at the end. Um, so that this one was developed by a, a Stanford. Um, uh, this firm was co-founded by a Stanford PhD student, um, and what they're doing here is um, taking these, these SkyCool panels. So these are uh, kind of uh, multi-layer films on these panels. Um, that are highly reflective to incident uh, solar radiation, um, but they also have very high emissivity, so they can uh, very effectively radiate heat. Um, and as a result, the fluid that's flowing, kind of getting piped through the panels, is able to achieve a temperature that's below ambient. Um, so they take that sub-ambient uh, fluid, which is um, water and glycol, I think in this application, and then they pipe it over to a refrigeration unit. Um, I think this is one of their applications on, um, on a, uh, a grocery store. Um, and that cooled uh, fluid can be used to make um, the refrigeration cycle uh, more, uh, get energy savings cooling, for example, the condenser or uh, cooling the refrigerant in that cycle. And one of the grocery stores was able to achieve like $3,000 of a monthly bill savings from this. Offshore wind is um, a, a really important emerging area for the state. Um, and I, I think I showed at the beginning that it could contribute very significantly to um, our 2045 100% clean energy future. So we've got some specific planning targets uh, for two to five gigawatts by 2030 and 25 gigawatts by 2045. Uh, the first lease sale was held uh, by Bohm, and um, so now there are developers um, that are uh, looking to um, deploy these technologies uh, in the near term. And we're conducting R&D to support um, this overall uh, resource um, through uh, uh, technologies and studies looking at environmental monitoring, uh, anchor and mooring designs, so the little um, plot of the, or the illustration of um, uh, mooring, line, mooring line configurations is uh, uh, sort of a schematic of um, a, a, a very simplified uh, kind of cartoon, but um, we have a, a very detailed model that's being developed by NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, to look at different configurations um, and uh, uh, based on uh, wind conditions and waves, um, seismic activity, et cetera, um, and cost considerations, what are some optimal 
configurations for setting up an offshore wind farm. Um, and then the uh, example on the bottom right is um, uh, Artcam Technologies, which is uh, developing 3D printing technology for uh, concrete. So this could be a way of uh, doing some um, low cost development of anchors and um, uh, uh, tower sections and so forth and, and cutting down on uh, transportation costs. So one of the big issues is these devices are so big that it's really hard to um, and costly to transport them uh, from anywhere else. So you need solutions that can be done, you know, um, uh, manufacturing approaches that could be done, for example, in the port um, and, and easily deployed. Uh, and then we're, we all, we're also uh, co-funding uh, with some other states and, and the federal agencies through the National Offshore Wind R&D Consortium. Uh, lithium recovery, I, I kind of previewed this uh, earlier. This is another important area. Um, uh, California is uh, lucky to have a, a really fantastic um, lithium resource down by the Salton Sea. Um, and so this is uh, not in the Salton Sea itself, but um, uh, further down the subsurface. And uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab just conducted uh, a study suggesting that the resource could be big enough to support um, battery manufacturing for 375 million EVs. So that, that's a pretty significant global resource. Um, and uh, um, it's also has the potential to be developed in a more environmentally benign way relative to other forms of lithi lithium recovery around the world, which includes like hard rock mining and evaporation ponds. So here it's leveraging uh, uh, geothermal brine uh, used for geothermal energy production um, and it uh, can be recovered and then the stream can then be um, discharged back into the reservoir. Um, a few of the issues here are uh, scaling, um, uh, shown with the tape measure there. So that's a pipe that's uh, um, experiencing uh, you know, deposits of minerals. Uh, so removing the silica from the brine is an important um, part of the process to control the scaling and, and uh, cost issues, maintenance issues associated with that. Uh, lithium um, uh, recovery uh, demonstrate uh, lithium recovery demonstration is another part of our portfolio. So we're doing a, a one tenth commercial scale system uh, currently, and then some um, areas looking forward are um, uh, trying to recover additionally uh, uh, valuable minerals such as uh, zinc and copper, uh, manganese and uh, magnesium, um, and then also uh, better um, uh, adv advancing pretreatment uh, strategies. So the uh, uh, handling the constituents before you uh, remove the lithium. Um, and then we also have a, a decommissioning um, gas system, decommissioning uh, uh, research and, and planning um, portfolio. So um, as more customers um, move towards uh, electrified equipment, um, they will be leaving the gas system um, over time. If that goes unmanaged, you have a uh, smaller and smaller group of gas customers supporting all the infrastructure. Um, so gas rates could really increase. E3's analysis suggests it could be 480% increase by 2050 if, if, go, if it went unmanaged. And so we're looking at opportunities to pare back um, the gas system in a strategic way that supports uh, kind of zonal approaches to electrification and reduces uh, the infrastructure burden. Um, so they've identified in this example 360 meters or customers uh, in the East Bay. If you were to trim the gas system uh, for them, um, the savings would be in the neighborhood of, of $30,000 per meter um, of avoided uh, replacement and uh, uh, repair um, costs. So um, we want to do this uh, more in a more automated fashion too. I mean, E3 is doing uh, uh, very analytically intensive, um, taking uh, a very analytically rigorous approach, but we want to be able to do this um, uh, at a statewide uh, scale. And so we're also looking to develop a data-driven tool uh, to kind of automate the process of figuring out, you know, where the infrastructure may have a safety issue or um, need replacement soon or be of a pipe type that's more susceptible to um, to rupture, et cetera. And there's some uh, upcoming funding in that area. And then um, the last segment here is 
uh, some new programs that I previewed before with the new state resources. Um, so I'll, I'll go into those now. I'll take a, a drink of water here. <laughs> Any questions on, on that so far? Mm -hmm. I was wondering, are there examples of successful projects in the utility scale solar um, space? And I don't know if there, there are other opportunities or challenges in that space. That's so. Yeah, yeah, the, the solar is already rapidly expanding on the grid. Um, so that's one of the, the fastest um, growing segments of the grid today. Um, and I showed the battery storage as well. So th those are really rapidly expanding because um, well, battery storage is critical for the grid balancing, um, and solar is a very abundant resource um, with mature technology to capture it. Yeah. And just for the terminology, long duration here for you is oh, yeah. like between two and twelve hours, and short duration you'd say is minutes. Or just the sorry, analogy. yeah, sorry, not to clarify that before. So what we're defining long duration as eight hours or more of duration. Um, and a typical like lithium ion battery would be about four hour duration. Um, but we're interested in, in longer time scales as well, tens of hours, hundreds of hours. Um, and we have some investments in that space. So um, yeah, that's a good intro into this. Um, so we have this new long duration energy storage uh, program um, uh, moving beyond li lithium ion, which is mat mature technology and, and less conducive for long durations. Um, and pumped hydro is also um, well established. So we're looking at uh, flow batteries, um, potentially like comp compressed air systems, um, gravitational systems are some of the different uh, technology options here. And there's gonna be a, um, a competitive solicitation um, for $90 million is planned in, in the next year. Um, clean hydrogen production is another one of our upcoming areas. Um, so uh, this is focused on um, uh, primarily electrolytic pathways to hydrogen production, so using electricity to break up water and, um, and to generate hydrogen that way. Um, but we also, at a more distributed uh, level, are interested in biogenic pathways uh, using, uh, for example, biomethane or other um, feedstocks to produce hydrogen in a way that could be um, uh, uh, used on site uh, so the centralized hydrogen is more envisioned to be electrolytic, uh, but dis distributed um, opportunities where the use and the production are both at the same site um, could be more mixed in this program. Um, and then we're excited about this new area um, to us, carbon removal. Like I, I mentioned in the scoping plan, we need to achieve uh, you know, tens of millions of metric tons of uh, CO2 reduction in mid-century, maybe 100 million metric tons. Um, and so this, it's important to start to invest in uh, performance improvements and, and cost reductions with these technologies. Um, the image is not a, a CC project, but the first commercial uh, direct air capture facility. So um, pulling carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere and then either utilizing it in a product, like I mentioned with 12, or um, pumping it into the subsurface for long-term sequestration. Um, so uh, um, Heirloom just launched their, their facility in Tracy and um, uh, have these trays of um, calcium hydroxide that um, capture the CO2 and then they heat up the end product and pull off the CO2 molecule and it's gonna be used in uh, cement production. So we're gonna be um, funding applied R&D, uh, field demonstrations and, and community engagement through this program. And then uh, industrial uh, decarbonization and grid support. So um, uh, this is kind of a very hard to decarbonize uh, segment of the economy. Um, uh, industrial emissions account for about a quarter of California's greenhouse gases and um, uh, coal is used in, uh, in making cement, um, uh, uh, tires and, and petroleum coke are used in making cement um, with glass manufacturing and chemicals as well. Those are the two others uh, that, are the, that have the highest greenhouse.
greenhouse gas footprint in the industrial sector um, after oil and gas and cement. Uh, so these are some of the areas that we're interested to try to decarbonize and make more grid friendly as we um, uh, do so, particularly with electrification strategies. And then another one on community energy resilience. Um, so we're fortunate to be receiving some funding from the Department of Energy. Um, and this is going to uh, be provided to um, uh, grid owners and operators and some of the other entities noted here. Um, but research institutions and other um, entities could, could partner with those types of eligible entities. And this is focused on um, uh, storage, um, microgrid components, uh, including the storage or the controls of the communications, um, advanced strategies for like reconductoring or, uh, or undergr undergrounding approaches, et cetera. Um, so opportunities to, to build um, resilience to climate impacts and make our, our grid uh, more robust. Um, leave it at that. Um, just a few other examples here. Uh, Epic has a lot of different um, uh, funding opportunities upcoming, just a few noted here. Um, more on the R&D of long duration storage to complement the deployment program that I mentioned before. Um, virtual power plants, um, the, load, the Cal, load, um, CalFlex hub um, initiative that I mentioned at LBNL, we're looking to create something similar for the industrial ag and water sector. And then um, there's a lot of wonderful federal resources as well, uh, battery, in, battery manufacturing and direct air capture. Um, so we're looking to leverage those funds um, help California um, project teams and entities um, uh, make good use of those, those funds and, and pair in some cases with, with state funds. And then I uh, alluded to this a little bit, but um, many of these uh, uh, firms and, and many others in our portfolio have Stanford connections of one sort or another, PhDs, uh, postdocs, undergrads, et cetera. Um, so it's an impressive uh, network of innovators across the state, and Stanford's playing a key role in, in training uh, those leaders. And then just wanted to leave it here with some opportunities to collaborate and connect. Um, Mike and um, um, others um, are leading this Stanford CEC partnership. So um, uh, Mike's providing uh, advisement to uh, the CC on R&D and energy assessments. Um, and so we're benefiting greatly from that um, expertise and perspective and looking to expand that and engage more people on campus. Uh, so there's an opportunity to just think about a broader uh, partnership there. Um, working uh, with Leong now too on uh, some opportunities for us to partner around um, some other areas as well. So I uh, look forward to just further conversation to see what's possible. Um, uh, Schultz Fellowship Program is a great way to um, get an experience at the CC or some other state agencies where you can get a stipend and um, come join our agency or another for, for the summer. Um, there's collaboration on topics of mutual interest. If you're doing research on an area you think is of interest to the CC or a pro maybe a class project, um, uh, we just uh, uh, partnered with um, the Goldman School, um, one of their classes was doing some analysis related to the CEC. So um, welcome interest um, in, uh, in maybe partnering on a, on a class project or a research uh, topic. And then um, we've got the volunteer program, a uh, nice way to maybe get some insights into uh, uh, state service. Um, career opportunities as well, you know, I'd love to just encourage wherever I can um, have people to consider uh, public service and, and moving into this clean energy space. Um, I didn't mention it, but this seminar actually, I used to come to it as a grad student and I was working in oceanography and fluid mechanics, um, but this was a great way to just kind of get a glimpse of you know, what was going on in the energy space. So um, you know, maybe um, so some of you might be interested in taking the next step and, and, and trying out um, a career opportunity and um, funding opportunities as well upcoming. And there's a couple of sites here if you want to track you know, our upcoming solicitations. So thank you, appreciate it. Thanks very much, uh, Jonah. That was extremely informative, a lot of information in there. So now we have a little bit of time for questions in the room. Any questions? 
raise your hands. Mike, you want to over the famous Thank you for your talk. Uh, so I guess since you have a really good uh, overview of all the projects that are coming up, I'm curious, uh, do you see, are there certain uh, problem spaces that I think more people should be working on? Um, we need help across the board, I would say. But um, I think energy storage in particular is a really important emerging area. Um, uh, we have wonderful um, uh, uh, intermittent renewable resources in California, great solar uh, resource. Um, our offshore wind is really promising as well. Um, but to bring those all together in, in a way that meshes with uh, the demand side, storage is going to play a fundamental role. Um, I mean, I could, I could mention every, every part of the portfolio. They're all critically important. Um, uh, demand flexibility on the other side. Things that, I guess the, the broader theme maybe is things that can support grid reliability. Because as you go to more renewables, um, you're dealing with more intermittent resources. And so how do you bring those together in a way that meets energy services that require energy at a particular time? So there's different approaches, either storage um, or demand flexibility or you know, a, a balanced portfolio of different renewables that have different generation profiles throughout the day and through different seasons. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, I was really, really excited when I saw the 25% market share of EVs yeah. in California. Mm -hmm. I'm from Colorado, and we're doing pretty good over there. But what do you think other states can do to um, get that level of success? Right. Um, I think you know building the infrastructure is sort of fundamental because um, otherwise you have got sort of range anxiety and and uh, you know. Um, so you want to build up that confidence that there's going to be the infrastructure there to get you where you need to be. Um, I mean, I think that the vehicle market itself is really developing and, and you know, greater ranges, so that alleviates some of the range, range anxiety just because there's more capacity on the vehicle itself. Um, I would think anything that could support infrastructure development is going to be, you know, kind of first step. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I'm wondering, is there any uh, citizenship requirement for the state level funding? Because I know there is for federal level. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of any citizen citizenship um, requirement on the funding. Um, uh, there's maybe one exception, which was Russia. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I think it was, you know, if there's a, uh, a, a company that's Russian owned, um, there was a prohibition on that. But I'm not aware of any others. Other questions over here? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you talk about electrification and gas decommissioning. So I'm, I'm curious, just do you think it's possible for um, like every residential house to completely get rid of gas appliances? I know it's like doable, but I also noticed that many people, they would prefer gas stove and like fireplaces because mm -hmm. they like actual flames. You highlight an important barrier, which is, you know, customer preferences, um, which vary. And so, um, you know, I think our objective as a state is to make it um, as um, affordable and, um, you know, compatible with uh, different lifestyles, different um, cho consumer choices. Uh, so it's driving down the cost of, you know, electric technologies um, and, uh, and, you know, there's actually really, I mean, I just got an electric um, range and it's super high performing. I mean, it's very responsive. So, um, you know, I, I told my family and they're kind of interested now and like, you know, they're trying it on my stove. And so there's just kind of um, a little bit of a neighbor effect too, you know, as you see other people adopt technology, you know. Uh, the mindset maybe evolves a little bit, but um, uh, I, I think what's important is um, uh, meeting people where, where they are, what their preferences are, and figuring out solutions that are compatible with that, not necessarily trying to change their minds about something, but maybe um, coming up with uh, technology solutions that kind of incorporate the preference. Um, so what is it about the gas uh, range performance that is the underlying, you know, contributing to the preference? Is it something about, you know, the responsiveness or 
um, some other aspects of it, and then trying to design the new electric technology to kind of satisfy that preference. Great. Any final questions? Uh, right here. Maybe I'll make that the last question because technically we're supposed to end around now. That's okay. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for your talk. It's so refreshing. I used to work in local government to see a government doing so much uh, innovation work. Um, my question is about a little bit how um, government can get out of the way as well as supporting these projects. Uh, so I've been really excited to see Solar APP Plus rolled out for residential uh, solar in California. And I just wondered whether you guys were exploring any utility scale solar or wind projects uh, or other form of renewable energy projects which automate the permitting process and try and speed up um, the rollout of that energy. Yeah, that's, that's a really important barrier, um, just um, permitting and um, interconnection of new resources. Um, so it's an important topic. Um, it's a little bit outside of the, the bounds of my personal expertise, but I know folks like Liang um, and others are really focused on these issues. And so it, it's something that the agency is very focused on. Um, I would defer to someone like Liang to give you a lot of technical insight on that. Yeah. Great. Uh, there are no other questions. I'd like to do two things. I'd like to thank Jonah and Mike for sharing their time with us and uh, giving us all this information and uh, hopefully inspiring it. Thanks a lot for ending with what you can do yeah. uh, for all of you and the audience, including students. And then finally, on behalf of Rachel and Chitanya and I, thank you all for coming this quarter. This is our last seminar for this quarter. We'll see some of you, doubtless, uh, in January. When's the first seminar in January? January 8th. January 8th. So we're kind of offline until then. But if you have any ideas for speakers, continue to let them uh, flow. We benefit a lot from that kind of thing. So with that said, thanks one last time thank uh, you. for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.